Kitco Mining Special Coverage of BMO's 33rd Global Metals Mining and Critical Minerals Conference is brought to you by First Majestic Silver. Patriot Battle Metals surprised everyone when its chair became the CEO. I'm with Blair Way. He is the COO and uh, executive director at uh, Patriot Batter Metals, and I'm with the new CEO, that's Ken Briston, and also Patriot, also president, rather, at uh, Patriot. Uh, gentlemen, uh, welcome to Kitco. Pleasure to be with you, Michael. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much. Um, I, we were talking about this before. Uh, we'll, um, uh, you know, we'll, we're, we're having an interview with uh, both of you at the same time, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll take uh, answers from either of you as go through. But uh, first, Ken, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, you um, when you had the appointment, uh, there was an announcement. Uh, you were uh, formerly with uh, the head at uh, Pilbara Minerals. Uh, you took that company from Devolve and to a producer. It is now the largest or one of the largest uh, lithium producers in the world. Why did you decide uh, to take on a CE role again? And why did you decide to do it at Patriot? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really motivated by the development story. And that's, that's absolutely what Patriot's discovery at Corvette has become. Um, it's moved beyond being just an exploration play. And I think most people can see that that it's now got you know serious potential and and one day will be a mine. So, from my point of view personally, I would say that represents a great opportunity and a great challenge to to get my teeth into. Um, but really, when you get to the heart of it, it's just a such a good project that I couldn't avoid being involved. I think the you know my passion is all about um, building mines and working with great teams, and we've got that in spades at Patriot. So. Yeah, I felt compelled to, um, to get more deeply involved. Um, the last piece of the puzzle is, as you'd imagine, when you're in that development phase, the stakeholder engagement you know, really goes through the roof. Um, so being local to Montreal is a really important um, uh, demonstration of, you know, of, of um, accessibility to, to the locals, uh, province, the Cree community, to even customers downstream. So. Um, I probably have a bit more flexibility than Blair in terms of my capacity to actually move to Montreal and, and you know, get involved with the team there. And really, that, you know, the changes in management, that's really what represents the, you know, the end result that we've come up with is, is a, a hopefully a co coherent um, management and leadership response to ensure that we can demonstrate success at Corvette from here. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about uh, the timing of the announcement. Um, you know, uh, lithium has had its uh, terrible 2023, uh, and then we're also, you know, we're still, still heading into a soft market here in 2024. Why did you decide to do the announcement now instead of uh, rather than waiting when there might be a recovery? Uh, I appreciate it's been a, a tough time for, for shareholders and, and for equity investors in lithium more broadly. Um, but I guess the, the key motivation here is, is not so much about the share price, it's just more about the, the development stage that now the Corvette project represents. And, um, and with that move to the commencement of the approvals process and, and the, the more deep sort of work in engineering um, and, and for that matter, discussions with the Cree, you know, the implication is that you really need to have a more significant local team to make that work. So, so that's really the key from a timing point of view is just the development stage of the project. Uh, now, um, Ken, um, you, you had that experience again with uh, Pilbara Minerals, uh, and um, you could certainly say that uh, critical mineral sector has more primacy. It's certainly more important than Australia than it is in uh, North America, which uh, certainly has uh, more of a diversified uh, mining approach. Uh, is that fair? Is it a fair characterization? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, broadly speaking, I'd agree with that. Um, growth in China, you know, China's gone through a, a massive period of investment in new energy, of which mm -hmm. the, the critical minerals are always going to be a key kind of yeah, you know, yeah. feed, feedstock. Mm -hmm. And um, China, China's demand was going to be first um, supplied by Western Australia. That's actually a very kind of mm -hmm. you know, natural evolution in, in the mining game. A ready-made market for new spodumene operations with chemical conversion facilities in China. Uh, however, in the case of the Corvette discovery, um, we would say it's so much more about the, 
the future of the North American and European supply chains, much more so than China. In that respect, it's a, it's a different story. Corvette has the critical mass in terms of total tonnes to underwrite multiple chemical facilities. And as a result, we should be able to, to have sensible conversations with participants downstream that are also interested in building out those new supply chains that allow some diversity in the lithium world, at least diversity beyond China. Um, in which case, I think we represent a logical raw material supply base. So yeah, I see that as being part of both our challenge as we develop Corvette, but equally the opportunity um, to be a key part of the development of that new supply chain that takes us beyond China. I, that, that would, to add on to that question, I was just wondering about uh, the exposure to the uh, North American market, Ken. So um, what we've seen right now is, is that uh, BYD has just really come to the fore right now, uh, being one of the leading or the top uh, leading uh, EV producer. And then we see that there's kind of a stuttering that's happening with the uh, North American markets. Is there a concern about being tied too closely to the North American markets, looking at uh, how strongly China's coming on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously worth keeping an eye on, yeah. um, but I, I guess my personal view is that that's being overplayed. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure the story is really as, as bad as, as people are currently presenting, you know, with respect to EV demand and EV, um, the growth in the EV market, but particularly when you consider the time frame that we're talking about for development. Um, I guess the second point to make, um, we wouldn't overlook China at the same time because it's also an equally important lithium raw materials market. So from our point of view, um, the main game is in fact in the North American supply chain. Um, we've got time to, to build out those relationships that will ultimately deliver combination of raw materials and chemicals. And I would hazard a pretty good guess that there is going to be a lot of growth in that North American supply chain, despite people's views about EVs today. Mm -hmm. um, it's mainly because there has to be alternatives to China. That, that's actually one of the more serious risks to the development of the industry and the car industry in, in the Western world, but especially North America and Europe. They are going to have to create these alternative supply chains. Otherwise, we will continue to be wholly reliant on China because they dominate the market. Uh, Blair, I uh, wanted to turn to you just uh, talking about uh, the uh, supply uh, picture in uh, the lithium market. Um, obviously, we went from the highs in uh, 2022, and then we've just had this really tough period that's come through 2023. We see uh, the quarterlies, or I should say the year ends, that have come off from some of the majors, and they're really doing a cutback in uh, CapEx right now. Um, what has changed uh, with uh, lithium supply right now? Is you seeing like a lot of demand, or sorry, I should rather say supply destruction right now? And uh, is there anything else that is actually kind of happening that we might not be aware of uh, in the lithium space? I mean, it's, it's been a troubling time for, for the lithium space and people have been concerned about what we've seen going on in China. Spa prices kind of getting pretty scary. We've seen some pretty low prices, but it is a naturally cyclic process and, and China has and continues to and has dominated the space for some time. But of course, there's been some high prices that they've probably not been super happy with. So they've looked at alternative supplies and you've, you have seen those alternative supplies typically more expensive, but through grants and what have you, they've been able to sort of build up that supply. And it's actually probably limited some of the other Western uh, potential producers or, or developers to not get the funding that they needed to get into production. So it then pushes back on we're seeing the price, well, I think we'll start seeing the price return. The market is going to, uh, you know, have to take from, from what they've seen, the typical downturn we saw before in, uh, in 2020. And I think Cobra was selling at somewhere in the order of about 360 bucks a ton. That was a tough time. And in some cases, they weren't even taking deliveries. We haven't seen that this time in this round so far. We're seeing sort of an $800 ceiling, which is twice what it was only three or four years ago. So the market demand is still there. The, the dynamic of how, how China is going to choose to, I guess, acquire some of those materials, they kind of got pounded the year before. So I think they've responded in a in a way that you'd expect. They did the same thing in iron ore, and we've, we've seen sort of this sawtooth action as, as the pricing does continue. The, the demand profile for materials is quite staggering when you look. The number of EVs that are being sold worldwide 
in, in looking at China, looking at Europe, looking at North America, it's, you know, it, I think I've heard numbers of 30, 35 percent year on year. Maybe it's dropped down to 28 percent. There's still massive numbers. So I think longer term, if you sort of look further down the road, the likelihood that the demand will continue to ramp up and it'll, it'll have its ups and downs along the way. But the demand is going to be there. The EVs are there. Stationary storage is, is taking off. We're seeing you know, lots more deals coming for very cost-effective uh, in-house storage and the, and the like for solar systems. So that demand for lithium is not going anywhere, and we're going to see a change in the market as as we have in the last downturn. But it's going to be, I think, a healthier return. And maybe we don't see the crazy spikes we saw before because there is the capacity for that supply to just be a bit more sensible. I think China's dominance ultimately gets won or gets, um, uh, um, you know, becomes less significant over time as the West responds with their demand, which to me seems very, very likely. Um, You're not going to let China own the entire car industry globally. So at some point in time in the cycle, um, there'll be a reversion that says, well, we have now have no choice. We have to invest in EVs and, um, and the supply chain will follow. Um, I think it's highly likely that that happens between now and 2030. Otherwise, there won't be a car industry, you know, in the US or, or in Europe, and China will own own the globe. Let's uh, turn to uh, Patriot. Uh, Blair, I want to start with yourself and uh, get some uh, updates. Uh, you're expecting uh, that uh, you're going to have uh, updated mineral resource estimate in Q3. Correct. So we've had an amazing year last year. We drilled about 45,000 meters to get to our maiden resource in August last year. We then drilled another 45,000 meters in the latter part of 2023. Those results have been coming through with multiple updates on CB5 drilling, CB13 drilling, and also CB9 drilling. We're now in this winter program. We have an 11 rig program underway now to basically infill drill the CB5 um, resource and actually bringing a little bit more up. So we're now taking it from an inferred resource to indicate it to feed into our future studies, which are a critical part of the development cycle that we're underway with the Corvette project and specifically at CB5, taking it from a discovery to now the development cycle of permitting it. So we submitted our project description at the end of November last year. And that's a kickoff to the process. We will get a feedback letter from the government soon on that in, in the coming weeks, which then gives us essentially a shopping list of what's required for an ESIA, what the expectations are for that. We're pretty familiar with what that's going to be, but that kicks off or defines that process. And then we'll feed in some of the ESIA work we've already done, but it's multi-season, multi-year collection of data, baseline information. So it's a busy year ahead of us to be able to feed into that and then uh, feeding into the timeline of permitting for the project. Uh, now, Blair, you mentioned uh, permitting. Um, Andrew Forrest had uh, some choice words about uh, permitting in uh, Canada with his uh, ring of fire, uh, for instance. Um, so um, you, you, are you feeling comfortable in terms of uh, being able to advance the project in terms of permitting? Absolutely. Quebec is a, is, a, is a separate province. So each province in Canada has their own challenges and similar to Australia. WA is an easier place to permit than, say, New South Wales, for example. So it's, there are these idiosyncrasies. And certainly Quebec is a, is a very mining-friendly jurisdiction. The current government is really supportive of the, of the build-out of the uh, lithium-ion battery you know, supply chain. Um, So what we have laid out ahead of us, we think is very achievable. We have received permits to date already. We've built a temporary camp, which is gonna be turned into a permanent camp of 80 people heading to 125. We've built out our access road as initially a snow road going to an all weather. And the permitting process for that has been very cooperative and interactive. It's not been like, we need this and you've gotta give this or stop, you can't do it. They're, they're looking at solutions so we can achieve the outcomes we need within the, the parameters or boundaries that are defined by a very clearly defined permitting system. So what we've seen, you know, as I said earlier, we submitted our project description. That had a timeline. The feedback for that timeline from both the Cree and the Quebec government have been really positive. So we see permitted by the end of 27 construction and, you know, uh, commissioning by the end of 28, which really dovetails in with what we see as a potential for uh, the hydroxide facilities, the conversion plants, to also be ready for us to feed to them. So mm-hmm. it really looks like a very achievable timeline. 
I, 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 Ken, um, in your uh, presentation, uh, one of the things that you mentioned just talking about refining is, is, is that, um, quote, uh, lithium chemical refining is currently missing link in the Western supply chain. Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, China, again, dominates yeah. that, that, uh, that sphere. In the last decade, they've built huge amounts of chemical conversion capacity, and that's further entrenched their, their, um, you know, their dominance in the, the valuated chemicals uh, delivery globally. And unless there's an investment in the Western world, um, they will continue to be very heavily reliant on, on principally China. Um, now, the good news is that there is moves afoot to change that paradigm. And, and in fact, some of that investment is already underway. It's underway in Western Australia, Korea, and in Quebec itself. And I'm certain there'll be more because there is going to be a, you know, a need for this alternate supply chain to develop. Um, uh, could it and should it happen in Quebec? I would say yes, absolutely, because for all the reasons that Blair just outlined, Quebec is actually a great place to be, to be involved in, in mining. There's an underlying culture around um, mining being a key part of the economy. Um, the, the, the frameworks within which the, the bureaucracy works are strong in a similar way by my experience, actually, in a similar way to they are in Western Australia, for example. Um, so, yeah, my broad observation is um, Quebec is a great place to be doing this business. And, and you know, the, the Quebec provincial government is, is you know, genuinely um, supportive of the development of this industry. So I think the combination of all those things uh, and, and lastly being involved in the James Bay region where um, the Cree are also actively engaging with, with the mining sector. Um, where there is true partnering with the Cree, um, I think you can have a constructive relationship and ultimately the timely development of a mine. But it's incumbent on, on us as miners to be working really hard to demonstrate that, that we are good partners in that part of the world. Uh, you had the large cash infusion from uh, Abelmar, uh that was announced. Um, Abelmar right now, uh, just given the soft uh, lithium prices, they have been cutting back on their capex. They announced within their um, quarterly that uh, they're going to focus on organic profitable growth. That doesn't have any effect uh, with uh, the uh, financing that you arranged with Patriot. No, not, not, not by our measure. So yeah. the relationship with Albemarle is going really well. We're enjoying working with them. And um, whilst there's a bit of water to go under the bridge in that, in that relationship, I think we're off to a really good start. So we're optimistic about that working for, for both of us um, over time. Uh, last question I'm going to have about uh, timelines as well, and leave it with you, Ken. Uh, talk about uh, what's the plans over the next uh, 12 months. What do you have to achieve? Yeah. Uh, move to Montreal, I guess. Oh, of course, yeah. Yes. No, I'm enjoying Montreal. Um, uh, no, um, yeah, I mean, the strategic objectives for the company are really all about um, you know, cementing that, that sort of, you know, really important asset base at Corvette and demonstrating the, the scale such that the rest of the industry downstream and, and even the provincial government kind of understand the significance of what's being discovered there. It really is remarkable. And I'm pretty confident will be a very important part of the future growth in the industry, um, both North America and Europe. So, so that's important to us, um, demonstrating the district scale exploration potential while we're underwriting the development case for CV5. Uh, and in addition, we're doing more work to, to you know, um, to, to establish this important relationship around the future of the North American supply chain. So basically chemical, chemical relationships, chemical deals um, that have the effect of more deeply integrating Corvette as a future mine to the, the North American market. Ken Brisden, Blair Way, thank you very much for speaking with Gecko. Thank you. Pleasure, Pleasure Michael. Thanks. My name is Michael McRae here at the BMO Conference for Kitco Mining. Kitco Mining special coverage of BMO's 33rd Global Metals Mining and Critical Minerals Conference is brought to you by First Majestic Silver.